argument, a book, the words must perform on the page, and you have succeeded at that. They come, they absolutely come to play. So, was it, was, was it hard, was it hard to, to write it? Was it hard? Yes. It was really hard. I'm yes. so impressed with anybody that writes a book. Because yes. It's, well, I think when you're writing a memoir, you really should go deep, and there's no way you can know what you're getting into until you start doing it. But yeah. I just think it's important for people to share stories because it helps people, and you feel very vulnerable. It feels very great. It felt great. Nobody asked me to do it. I just motivated my, myself. Because <laughs> people are oh, people asking you to write it. I'm like, nope. <laughs>
Yeah, so we're in the hospital, and I was, I, I remember I had to go to the bathroom, and you know, I just learned how to, you know, not wipe my pants, my training pants, and I was like, I want my mommy, I want my mommy. And nobody was coming, and then I just wet myself, I just was despairing, and I just kind of gave up, and, and I, nobody was really telling me what was going on, and I looked to my sister, Mary, to be kind of a guidepost, but she was just staring out the window. She was six and she knew more of what was going on, and she was just crying and you know, looking out the window. It's very sad. So I was just like, I made up the story that, oh, well, my mom must be with my baby sister Katie in the baby section, since nobody was telling me where they were. And so one day, after waiting when nobody would say anything, I just got up and got myself dressed, and I was like, I want to go see my sister. I went up the ramp and I was like, I want to go see my, my, my sister and my mom. And the nurse, like, because I just thought if I could just go up the ramp through the double doors, I'll be able to find them. But the nurse was like, no, 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 and she, she brought me back to my bed. And then I think they finally felt like somebody that better tell the, the girls what's going on. So I think an aunt, I don't remember who, came and told us. But they were bringing us all these toys, like dolls, we had all these presents and toys in our beds. But it was just kind of like sad, we were like, all these toys, but what's going on? And, so then somebody did say, yes, your mom is gone, and your baby sister, they've gone to heaven. And like, like it was good yeah. news or something, like trying to tie it up, and I was like, what? I, I didn't understand what it was, and so I just thought, well, could, could we get there? Could we, can I get there? Can I, can I, can I, can we take a hot air balloon? Can I fly there? I just couldn't accept, accept it. Right. And um, so, so I think um, that's just, how a child of four the brain process that information. Maybe if you've been seven, you're developmentally older, but I was so little it didn't make any sense. And so I just kind of went into a fantasy waiting. I, I couldn't, there was no way I could really accept that. So I just kind of pushed away and was still wait, waiting for her to come back. Right. Yeah, yeah, you basically said if you had let yourself know they're dead, you would have been annihilated. And so you had to create some other scenario. Exactly. Right. Later, when we, when we moved in with my aunt, um, my, we would do like normal stuff, like, like you know, go to the like, grocery store and you know buy like a little pail or a little toy. Or, we would, or my aunt was teaching us how to tie our shoes, and I was like, oh, everything we did, I was like, my baby sister was Katie, and my baby sister was there, so Katie would die. I was like, Read the 
that they kept like building in on stuff that I never knew. It's, it's really cool. Yeah. I actually, when I read that, I actually fell in love with the It was a lovely, lovely, very lovely thing. So the accident happened in 1969, uh, you know, around, around yeah. that time. Uh, 50 plus years have gone by. Um, time with her. I know when life is cut short, that's not long, but I do appreciate it. So I think it gives me this kind of appreciation for time and life and a kind of urgency. And um, it's like, even now my kids are both in college and people are like, empty nested, you're an empty nested. And I'm like, oh, what does that mean? Yeah. It sounds like I picture like a depressed mom. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't relate to it at all because I don't like, appreciation for time and life, but like, I got to live so far beyond the years my mother did. Like, my mom didn't get to see me grow up, but I got to see my kids grow up. Yeah. So I just think, oh my god, I'm so glad. Oh, my God. 
Luke again in the Saturday Night Live stuff, but um, yeah. but um, one thing is Sally O'Malley, the character that I. <laughs>
for all for Sarah and I. Oh, my audition? Well, um, well I, I was hustling in LA, you know, really working in restaurants a lot, and I was, I, well, should I tell the real story first? Because that's all yeah. real I said. But, um, but, but I, I decided I would try to show Adam Sandler was in that 
show too, because he was in my grade at, at year at SNL. And Madeline, year at NYU, and Madeline looked like the director while we were rehearsing, we had us do this exercise to come up with characters for this comedy show. She was like, I'm gonna do this exercise, but I'm gonna play a really snotty director, and you cast have to come in and try to impress them, try to get that part, try to win me And over. she was hard. She, she was tough. She, was, she played a very tough director, like very unimpressed. And she was like, don't overthink it, just come to the door and make it a character. And I, I made up Mary Catherine Keller, I just went, <laughs> And it was really popular. And then people on campus started telling me, you should get on Saturday Night Live. And I was like, really? I never, I never thought of it. So then cut to, Gina and I gave, I thought maybe I'll go out and then move to LA and try to get out on television. So Gina and I gave New York a year, and then we thought we'll move to LA, to Hollywood, and try to do our own show. And, yeah, and also try to get an agent. And try to get an agent, exactly. But it was really hard. Um, yeah. You would go mail in your headshot up and down Sunset Boulevard and set their head shut out of the door and nobody would call or actually once Gary Coleman's agent did. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I told the story that he, that he, he was like, come on and he took an instant meeting with me and I was like, oh my god, this is Gary Coleman's manager and he had a big picture of Gary Coleman below and he was like, oh, give me a little twirl.
Friday at four, we'd get everybody who's in a good mood. So I would call the agent's office, and I was like, this is Liz Stockwell, I'm calling for the ex-agent, I'm calling from David Mammon's office, and they were like, oh, they put me right through to the agent. <laughs> and then I'd say, oh, listen, um, you know, listen, Kim, oh, we have this kid in, oh, David speaks so highly of your agency, and they were like, oh, they were so flattered. Please give David my best. We chose David because we kind of knew he wasn't a guy who was in Hollywood, he like, lived on the main and wasn't a guy. And this was pre-internet, so they couldn't really know. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, so, so then I was like, I have this great kid, I'd love for your company to meet him, he needs representation, he's the star, we made him the star, he's the star, David's in play, he's an up and cover, and she's the hottest thing. And she's like, oh sure, just have him call when he comes to town. I was like, you know what, he's, he's, he's only here for a few days, so if I could just set the meeting up now. Because we had a rule, just like in sales, don't hang up the call to get the sale. <laughs> Parents would 
hard time, he's struggling, brain's on his leg, he got disability income. But it's like, so someone maybe gave him a babysitting money to make it look like he was paying for our friend. So I had to like give him like 20 whatever. But then sometimes like a friend would offer him money. Like, can I give you an example? Yeah, yeah. Like, can I take one of these out? Yeah. Like pretend like you'll be the girl. This is like, I, 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 I wanted to just demonstrate. Okay, so pretend like you're the, you're my friend Allison and you're gonna offer me okay. Jim Shannon. Like, okay, here Mr. Shannon, take my 20. So so the Neil's come and, and and I would I would want him to pay for it, but so so the Neil's come to say, you're my friend, you me but here Mr. Shannon 20. Mr. Shannon, here's 20. No. No, keep on keep offering. No. <laughs> And um, but of course, of course, no hotels would take us. They wanted a 
told with a credit card. And um, my dad said, can't you just be in the lobby? No, 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 no. So he was like, all right, girls, you got to come back home tonight. But you got to hop on a plane home. <laughs> <laughs> And we would do our little scheme, we'd get on the plane every time, and then somebody, it was overcrowded, they go, hey, this is our seat, you can try it. And then we had to call him, and we were like, it's not working, and he was like, all right, put in my credit card, got us a flight, and then we came home, and of course talked all about it, and he wanted to hear about the adventure, and, and then we ended up paying back with our babysitting money. And we just said, we have to have been paying that pay, pay him, pay back the ticket. Yeah, but it was a fun, full day of New York City Good actress, and I saw Lauren in the audience. 
Chris Farley, is that my audition? <laughs> There was one woman who was a scout, I guess, for SNL for years, and she was never bringing me in. Like, she was somebody who just, she was just more of a comedy boys and not as much of the girls. And I was like, she's missing all the good women. Like, ah, she was like the person that was so hard to get through, and I, I knew it was a mistake. I was like, she's not. And so it was funny. And then she finally heard that I got an audition, and she, she was like, oh, well, you know, yeah, I heard you got an audition. She goes, but whatever you do, when you audition for Lauren, don't do that character in Mary Catherine Gallery. Because you'll never get hired. You know, hate that dirty little character. <laughs> she also said, hey, you'll never get the job. You'll never get hired. So when I auditioned for SNL, I did not do that character. Because she told me not to. Yeah. So basically, I did the, I did the characters. And I remember being like, oh my god, I'm bombing. Because nobody was laughing. And, and I remember, like, I had my little bag of props and glasses. And I remember, like, oh, I'm tanking. And I turned around and put on my little props glasses and I thought, you know what, let me just be a good actress. I'll just commit and hopefully Laura will appreciate that. I'm not going to worry about laughs. And it went really well. And I didn't hear anything. And then months passed. And then I got a call saying that Laura wanted to meet with me. Yes, to meet with me. Yeah. And I was so excited. So I was living in California. So I got flown to New York. And we had a great meeting. And Laura was really nice. And and I met a guy on a plane. He was a businessman. I went to my meeting with Lauren. And he had and ask him opinion questions, like ask him his opinion about stuff. And that ended up being very good advice because Lauren likes giving his opinion. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, then, and then, so, so then I met Lauren and I, I went back to my sister Mary's apartment in Tribeca. We celebrated, celebrated over a glass of Pinot Noir. And we were so excited and interesting. And then I left her apartment. I was flying in cloud nine and I got mugged. Threw <laughs> down on the ground. Yeah. A lot of people told me, no, 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 that's never going to work. 
And I just didn't listen to them. I was like, jump over that hurdle. Hey. Jump over that hurdle. Yes! And so yes! I found this writer, and he goes, well, why don't you tell me what you do in your show? Tell me exactly what you do in your show. And I go, like, come on. And I go, hi, America, the calendar. Then I do this, and he, he typed it up, and we typed up our very first sketch. And he buoyed it with a few more solid jokes, writerly jokes, yeah. including what I did in my show. Put it into the table read, and at the table read, all the 17 actors sit around the table, and the producers and set designers, all it's a big room of like 100 people, and you sit with more than half the table, and you read like 45 sketches, and then from those 45, they pick maybe, you know, 14 in the show, and then you do a dress or something, and they cut it down to the ones that will air live in the show. And I did the Mary Catherine at the table, but I'm reading stage directions, like, oh, she falls in the chair, so I'm not doing it, they don't know what it is. But Lauren was like, he saw the potential. So he said, you know what, let's wait till Gabriel Burr, we'll do it next week. So we, we went and did it. But then we were, we were, and I was excited they got picked, but then the day of the show, they have the dress rehearsal schedule. And usually stuff that they really believe in is at the top of that dress rehearsal show schedule. And stuff that they think won't make it to the live show is at the bottom. And Mary Catherine was at the bottom, and I was like, oh. I was like, I don't think they're gonna understand what this is. Physically, they don't know what it is because they've never, they were just reading the directions. But because I worked so hard on that show, I knew what it was. Like, I knew what people laughed at. And I was like, kind of like a show them. I'm like, blew the roof off the house. And so, so basically, um, you know, it, what happened was, and then we didn't even get to rehearse it. They, they ended up, oh, it's time for dinner. And so we just had to like walk through it. We didn't even have an official camera walking the way you would if you had time. And then the dress rehearsal came, and I remember my heart pounding when I was backstage. Like, five, four, three, two, one. And I was so nervous. Me, Molly, Shannon, and so nervous. But I thought, I, but I used that nervous energy and poured it into the character, and I just went wild, and I did it, and it went great, and, and uh, it was so great. And then you go into Lauren Michael's office between dress and air to see what makes it in the show. Everybody goes and looks at the bulletin board, and there's all these like index cards with what makes it. And, I looked in my sketch mirror, Kevin Gallagher, got, Gallagher got moved from the bottom of the show to the top. Did you know when, when you did it with that, the first one gave red bird was the priest, did you know that during it, this thing is killed? Um, yes, I did really feel, I felt that it was going right. But it's I didn't, I would never do stuff like that now. Now, like, I get scared, but I threw myself in the chair. I wouldn't feel any pain. I would wait until the next morning and I'd be bruised and cut. My muscles hurt. But in the moment, I could feel nothing, right? And um, this is so funny. My friend, Deborah, Deborah, Deborah Palermo, who I write a lot about the book, she used to come to all my shows and she used to always be like, there's my superstar. Like, she was always calling me superstar. So as a joke, the first time I ever did the Mary Catherine, I had left the stage, it went great. I I, I left, and the audience, Jim Brewer was like, I've never heard a roar so loud that loud in the studio. I went up, and I came back up and slipped on the chair, and then I just, to make my friend Debbie back at home in California laugh, I just whispered, Suicide. Like, really? <laughs> Yeah. So I, I really knew the beats of the character. Yes. 
And I, and I wasn't like writing, you know, I would do oral writing, where I would perform it, and then after my shows, I would learn, and I would take walks around the block and go, that joke worked, that joke worked, and I would just write notes. She starts out shy, she's so scared, she's so scared, and he has to push her center stage, and, and then she gets warmed up. So I had these beats that I would follow, and I would, and I would, I would remind myself, I, I worked it, worked it over the years. Yeah, I mean, there's a narrative arc. At the end, you know, you can't, it seems like she's not gonna do it. Totally goes over the top. Then she's always victorious. Yes. She Woo! always wins in the end. Yeah. Right? And then that wonderful um, addition, uh, maybe halfway through the sketch, when you would do um, a, a, to express your feelings, you would perform the monologue of a major TV. <laughs> Between you and Anna and John, it was like 
It was like masterful music. It was like jazz. Your your yeah. flow of that. How did you How did you find that? With that sketch or any sketch, but how do you find that kind of connection? I mean, I don't know. It's such a fast moving show, so you just yeah. have to really get out there and do it. But um, I don't know. Will Ferrell and I always had a thing that we did together where if we were bombing, we would commit harder. Oh. <laughs> 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 we went to the sketch and we were like, we did it center stage. And usually we did a sketch because the, the studio is pretty small. There's all these different areas where they do the sketches. Some are harder. Mm -hmm. But the center stage, you get the full audience there. If you're doing your sketch on the side, it's hard to get left. But we did it center stage. And we played two characters who recently lost 100 pounds. Okay. And <laughs> we were like, congratulations, Jean, you lost 100 pounds. And, and, I, and there were crickets, not an ounce of laughter. And it was like, oh my God. But we just had a joke where we would look in one of those eyes like with a twinkle, and we would just commit harder and just really just warm the hell out of it and just try to be really good actors. And so it felt like this, like we would embrace bombing. So <laughs> Bombing, and it was based on this um, 60 Minutes episode that I saw where Japanese businessmen, if they fail, they would have to like douse themselves in their failures, feel the shame, and crawl on the floor, and like embrace the, sh the, the like failing. Yeah. And I thought that was a cool thing. <laughs> because they do go together, and you can never get too addicted to the. Yeah. And Jeannie Darcy, the stand up comedian, I was going to ask about that. that I did toward the end of my run because it was kind of based on like, oh, I'm so sick of trying to get laughs. Time and I just did it kind of as a creative exercise to do like a really dull comic who really does not have what it takes, but she's just determined. And she's also like supposed to be kind of like out of touch with her sexuality. And she's like, don't get me started, don't even get me started. She's bad, she is not. Bad. But so when I first did it at the table, it did not get picked at, to be on the show. And then you're not just a quick sketches back in if you did get the first time, but I was like, please, can I? I tried again, and um, and um, I did eventually get it on Weekend Update, and Will Ferrell and Jimmy Fallon loved it. They just, and the audience didn't really know what it was. They were like, what is this? And they didn't get it, but um, I would really just do it to make Jimmy and Will laugh. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not a lot of people would lean into the possibility of failure like that. I mean, that, that is a, a totally common thing. Most people yeah. want to hit and want, want to laugh. Yeah, that's gutsy. I like it. You. Well, Hollywood, the town can be like that. It's like if you do really well, you're up, and some of you don't know what's going on, and people can be phony. And, but I always try to just, you know, I try to have a healthy attitude about that, and yeah. not, you know, yeah. to just enjoy performing and enjoy. Like I remember when I was really struggling in LA before I got SNL and before, and a friend of mine got a part on Charles in Charge, and I was like, bro, and I went to rack and. Selling all the supplies in a little dumpy office in Hollywood, and I remember he got this part, Charles and Charles, and I was so jealous and so upset. And I took her to walk around the block, and I was like, Why is he get Charles and Charles and I get nothing? Why, <laughs> God? In the San Fernando Valley. And then during that moment, I thought, Well, at least you're out here in LA trying, yeah. pursuing what you love. A lot of the people that I've gone to college with had moved back to Ohio and given up on their dreams, and I was like, there's something to that, so that is really good. That's a good life, and it's meaningful. So I'm just gonna keep trying till I'm an old lady, and that I made up a pact with myself on that wall. Yeah. Yeah. You're, and you're, 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 Before that, though, for my very last show, I had met my now husband. 
husband. And my dad had been in AA for a while, so he was sober, but I think he was like a little, he was used to, you know, I think he was like, oh, Molly's off just inviting Fritz and his family, what about, I mean, he was feeling a little downer. So he showed up drinking, and he'd, he'd been in AA, and he'd done very, years and years of sobriety, but he slipped, and he, he came to my last show. This is in 20, this is February 20th. Two thousand. Okay. So, so basically, 2000. Yeah, 2000. So I was like, oh. and he, he he met some college kid like at the higher agency bar or something. He brought this strange, cute college boy into my apartment, and I was like, oh my god. He's like, Molly, this is Thomas. I met him at the bar, and I was like, oh. I was stressed out because I was with my mom last show and I was rehearsing, and so I was kind of mad. I was like, oh. So I called my manager, Stephen Levy, who is out proud gay. And Stephen Levy and my dad had formed a friendship because Stephen Levy had lost his dad when he was a kid. And uh, so Stephen and my dad got close for me. And we talked on, on their own. But I mean, I said I was complaining and Stephen kept defending my father. And he said, oh, Molly, you're being too hard on him. Don't be so hard. He said, he's given up so much for you and Mary, given up so much of his life. And he kept saying that he's given up so much. I was like, what are you saying? And I was like, are you saying that he's gay? And he was like, I don't want to tell you, he's going to tell you. And, um, and I, I was like, oh my God. And I felt such compassion and I was like, oh my God. Like, I, of course I had had the thought before, but I would always kind of push it away. Like when I was in NYU, I would write letters from home, back, write letters to my dad back home and I would see like a picture of Betty Davis or a headshot of Joan Crawford and I would write on my headshot like, Dear Daddy, NYU is great, love and holy. So there were no signs. When I got my first colored headshots, my dad was so proud and he framed it with gold sparkles on it. He was like, come it out, so there were signs. kick him out of my apartment and send him back home. And then we ended up like having a, like a fight at the brew bar and I was like, this, you're making it all about you and I'm stressed out. And he was like, I'm sorry. And then he ended up staying and, you know, Stephen told me that and, and I just felt like such compassion and love. And then I was like, what's he gonna tell me? And then I was waiting and it gave me this whole new understanding. Like it blew my mind. Like it kind of made all the pieces come together. Like and the drinking and the, just everything. I was like, this makes this total sense. And my heart just went out to him and, you know, I just felt love and understanding. And then he came to my, my final SNL party. We just drank club soda. He was like back there, you know, wanting to work his AA program. And we had a wonderful time and Lord toasted me and it was beautiful. But then he still didn't tell me. And then he went back to Cleveland. And then I, I decided to, I told Lauren, I was like, I'm, I, that was like my last show, but then I really wanted to come back for the Mother's Day special. And Lauren was like, you can still come back in a few months, even though you're leaving now. And it was, it was a special show for the mothers, but more let me bring my dad. And Maya Rebecca also lost her mom when she was a little girl, brought her dad. So my dad was really excited because he always wanted to be an actor. He was, I was excited to get him on Saturday Night Live. But he, he wasn't telling anybody, but he was, he was so thin. Um, he had, he was, he had cancer, but he was keeping it secret, not telling you that. Oh, he was like shivering and thin. And, and then I think he did tell me on that trip, he said, you know, I have cancer. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, and I cried. And, and I was really worried. And, but he still didn't tell me about being gay or anything. But then, um, then the, the, the Mother's Day special aired, and he saw it, and he goes, oh. He was like, oh, I didn't like it. I looked terrible. I just looked so thin. And I, I thought, oh, here, I finally got him on television. I made his dreams come true. And he, he was just feeling kind of down. And I said, oh, Daddy, don't worry. I said, we all hate the way we look. We don't like the way we look. Most actors, we can't stand to look at ourselves. He was like, is that right? I go, yeah, I don't know. I'm nobody. And he was like, oh, that makes me feel so much better. And this local reporter wrote a big article about him. And, and it meant so much to my dad, this guy Tom Farron. So my dad read me the article, Jim Shannon stars on SNL. He got all choked up. And oh, it was very sweet. And then he still hadn't told me that he was 
Okay, so then I, I invited him out to, to a press junket that I had at Four Seasons for the movie Serendipity, and he got to stay in nice fancy hotel rooms, and we ordered cop salads, and we were sitting by the pool. We had red, white robes on, and, and then, yeah, we first eating our salads, and we moved over to the pool, and then I thought, I'm just gonna ask him. I'm gonna ask the million dollar question that only a daughter could ask. My parent is still alive, and he was 71, so I was just praying, and I was like, I took a deep breath, and I was like, have you ever thought you might be gay? And he was like, most definitely. <laughs>
saying more of us. He, he was like, <gasps> giving me a <laughs> like, small part. <laughs>
and so fun to watch. Would you, would you do that? Oh, I don't remember what you do.
Um, well, well and ambition over, it changes over time, right? So, so what is it that you're looking for now or projects that you might be looking, looking for now that turn you on? What has to be there for you? Um, well, besides coming to the more. number one, like it was always everything around my children, I love being a mom, and um, so it's, it's wild now, like so, so much of it was like, oh my god, being a mom and working, it was hard balancing it all, but so it's, it's wild that they're not, now that it's college, yeah. um, but uh, I don't know, I just, I just kind of take stuff as it comes, I'm yeah. not trying to worry too much about it, just see how it goes, but I, I love taking breaks and not working, and yeah. relaxing, yeah. living your life, swimming, and, yeah. And with your, with your husband, who's a great actor, a great artist. Yes. Yes. He's an excellent artist. So anything specific that uh, you want to do that you haven't done in life? No. No. I mean, I just want to get it Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, all right. So why don't we take some questions sure, from the audience? Sure. Is there any other story that we want to hear or there's something that didn't make it to the book that we oh, really yeah. should hear? Yeah. Anything at all? I just, well, I've 
been in a part in therapy. I think that's really helped. And yes. I would say I I try to you know if I'm feeling like overworked or stressed out, I definitely will can pull back and relax. In fact, because I feel like if, if you're working too much or too hard, that doesn't make me too happy. I like the yeah. right amount. Yeah. So I think I know when to pull back and take care of myself. And and you know. I, I, I shared about this on Jimmy Fallon. I, once when I was promoting one of those movies that um, I, won, I won an Independent Spirit Award for, I, won, I was so tired. So you have to go to all these film festivals and you're flying and you keep meeting fans. And I was like, oh my God, I need a break. I can't talk to anybody else anymore. And so I call it like a bed seven. It's where you're like, it's like if I was, if I was in a hotel for a night without my kids, I, it's like when you take to your bed for seven hours and you just lie in bed and you can order a burger if you want in a bed seven, you can text, you can watch TV, watch The Bachelor, you can order rigatoni, no talking on the phone, no talking. You can text if it feels fun, but just TV, food in bed, no talking or not. Like this, it gives you this like drive. 
But so I got in the darkest depression at the peak of S and L. But it was it was it, it ended up being like a blessing because it gave me like okay, fame doesn't fix anything. It's not going to bring my mother back from the dead to tell me she's proud of me, whatever. And but it gave me like just enjoy being creative. It doesn't matter if you're top or like number five thousand. It doesn't matter. Just enjoy being creative. And I realized that it doesn't fix anything, so I feel like I have a healthy perspective about creativity and fame. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, well, uh, at what moment did you realize you were famous? Was there something that happened that was like, oh, wait a minute, something's changed here? Let me think here. Well, Adam Sandler told me when I first started, he goes, you know, first they're going to recognize you, they'll see your face, and then they're going to start calling out your name. So that was true. So Adam kind of told me that, but um, I don't, I don't know if I really get that. Yeah, I think that's kind of built. Do you have any tips on making it as a comedy writer? As a comedy writer? Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm so proud I wrote my book. Yeah. So there's funny stuff. So write a book. So I consider myself a writer. Yeah. Write a book. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yes, I like to laugh a lot. I'm trying to think of 
Um, yeah, I, I think I, 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 yeah, I, I don't know if I made myself up. Sometimes they come from like weird things. Like, yeah. 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 Like, yeah. This, yeah. Or, something. or just an idea pops into your head or something. Yeah. Like, yeah. I let reality help me. Do you? <laughs> Get a guy, how do you get a guy to be more responsible? 
Now we're going to be the Anna Anders group. Dear Abby, no, no, so how do you get to be more responsive? I like that. How do you get to be more responsive? Well, well, I suppose you would, you should, you should, you should, uh, see the good things, like, 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 good, like, Love you since I was 11. I even have an MKG tattoo. 
from way back. Okay, so here we go. It's a great song. Okay, okay, great. Ready, everybody? Okay, let's go. Here we go. You ask me if I love you, and I choke on my reply. Use your singing voice. Sing it, baby. Sing it. Ha <laughs> ha.